Good morning. This is Tony Malberger from the Redlands Daily Facts, and I'm doing another video interview this morning with the Dr. Larry Bridges, who is uh, probably most famous for running the library for most of our lifetimes here. Uh, but there's so much more, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm glad to be here. We're going to start you off at the very beginning, the Smiley Brothers, the Smiley family. Can you give us some Smiley family history? They're coming to Redlands. Yeah, well, when you said the very beginning, I thought maybe you wanted me to talk about the invention of dirt. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> now that I'm retired. Uh, the, the Smiley family uh, came into my life not necessarily by coming into the library, because I had never really, as a kid, thought about, you know, Smiley Library. It wasn't me, but who were the Smileys? But it came to focus when I was a senior in college, and I, I was doing a senior paper for the history department, and uh, I was doing it on Redlands. And that name just, and all that they did came up and up and up and up. So then when I went on to graduate school, what was extraordinary about it is I was going to, I wanted to, you know, I'm young, and I'm energetic, and I thought I knew everything, mm -hmm. like young people do, and I wanted to do an important uh, master's thesis, and the professor looked at me and he said, well, I think you ought to work on the Smiley Brothers. And this was in Claremont at the Graduate University, and I said, what, the Smiley Brothers? And he said, yes, have you been to Pomona College across the way? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, did you look at Albert K. Smiley Hall? And I said, well, I knew it was there. He said, well, why is it there? And how do these Redlands people get involved with Pomona? And he said, are they Redlands people? And so that's what I did my master's thesis on, was a biography of the Smiley Brothers. I'm so that's how it got started. When you were a child, then you had, so you were a child in Redlands? Yes. Okay, and when you went to college, you were at the University of Redlands? Right. And then you went to Claremont for your right. grad school? Right. Okay. And so I, it, it opened up a whole new world. It led me to New York, which really were the, where they had most of their successes and influences, although they were from Maine. And uh, uh, it, it changed my entire life direction. So who were the Smiles? Well, they were, uh, uh, in this case, they were two identical twin Quaker brothers who left Maine and received their education elsewhere and uh, ended up uh, in New York but by way of Rhode Island, they took a, on the chairmanship or, or co-principalship of the school in, in Rhode Island, still in business, the Moses Brown School, very important prep school on the East Coast. And uh, they made a huge success of it, and a great name for themselves, advancing educational curriculum. This is the 1860s. And uh, then Albert Smiley had a nervous breakdown. How old was he? 45. And so, um, in those days, they called it nervous prostration. And um, he went to, to, uh, to a farm near Poughkeepsie. And um, the farm wasn't quite what he had hoped. And so his twin brother one day was on the other side of the river from Poughkeepsie at a place called Mohonk, and that's M-O-H-O-N-K. And at that time, it was a kind of a tavern. It was a local joint. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was fun for people. And uh, he thought, you know, this is the perfect place. We'll buy the tavern, and Albert can come up here and recuperate and get back to do it. So they bought it, and then they realized that, okay, you buy the lake in this tavern, and they're Quakers, so they're not going to be serving liquor, and because there were uh, tree stumps outside in front of the tavern by the lake in which they would tie up people when they were too drunk with ropes around the tree stump so they wouldn't fall in the lake and drown. It was that kind of place. And uh, so then they realized that if they bought the tavern for Albert to recover in as a home, mm -hmm. that it was too big for a home and there were rooms, and if there were rooms, they needed to fill the rooms, probably, mm -hmm. and that would mean all kinds of relatives and friends, which would cost money, and because they're Quakers and thrifty, they said, well, maybe we should run a small inn. Let's Describe for the people who haven't seen it because I was shocked when I first saw a photo. Right. This place is massive. It's massive. This it's it's an lake. eighth of a mile long. Okay. And lots of and, rooms. And How many rooms? Seven stories and um, 300 rooms. And but then it was just one with maybe 10 rooms. So they decided to go into the hotel business, which ironically enough, uh, they said was uh, even less well thought of to be a hotel person than it was to be a politician. 
This is an 1869 quote, so I just, I'll just leave that hanging there. And uh, uh, so they started catering to what they called the right sort, the people that wanted to come out of the city life, who were willing to come with uh, uh, just amenities, but not a lot of activities except dealing with nature mm -hmm. and with each other. And, uh, and of course, being from, a, again, a Quaker background, that meant no booze and no card playing and no dancing. And so people thought, this isn't going to make it. Did they have uh, families at this time? And they had families. And so uh, the, the, the brothers, the twin brothers, ran the business. And Albert got better, and then he went back to school. Alfred then continued to successfully manage the business. And then when Albert had decided to leave Moses Brown to come to Mohawk permanently, uh, he cast about for someone to help. And it was his younger brother. Uh, the, the twins had a younger brother who was 27 years younger. Their, their uh, uh, mother had died and the father had remarried. So Daniel, who was, was everything that Albert needed, uh, a brilliant guy, uh, started managing the, the enterprise. And then that's when Albert decided to do a lot of philanthropic enterprise and to finally tie it up. They were looking for a winter resort, because they, a winter, because they weren't open in the winter. Mm -hmm. And so they tried Florida and found it too hot and humid. And Albert had been to California earlier, for reasons we'll come into later probably, and he knew of this area. And ultimately, they settled here in Redlands. How did they travel to Florida and travel to Canada? There were no... All railroads. And uh, it was a, a pretty good deal in those days, because if you were a person well-connected or a person of influence, you often were given railroad passes and you could get very nice accommodations and travel literally for nothing. These people had money. Yeah. How did they get their money? Well, um, thrifty. Um, uh, they, they saved, and they began then to make a good deal of money from the resort, because when President Arthur came to Mohawk as a sitting president, that was big news, and it's like any town or, or business when when a sitting president goes somewhere, people will follow. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of President Obama when he goes to Hawaii, always goes to Alan Wong's restaurant. Well, Alan Wong's was already famous, but the last several years, it's almost impossible to get a reservation because it's had the imprimatur of, of you know, a very famous person. So when Arthur went to Mohawk, everybody in the East Coast was going, ooh, with this president Mohawk president. Yeah. He's the one that took over for Garfield after Garfield was assassinated. Okay. Yeah. So this would be in the 1880s. And uh, as a result of that, the place started to do very well. So when they came to California, to Redlands, uh, Frank Brown, the co-founder of Redlands, uh, writes in a letter to a, a colleague of his here in town. He says, you know, now with the coming of these smileys, these eastern people, this will help to put... Redlands as the coming spot. And it did, because they were very well known on the East Coast by this time. Uh, and Albert, for his philanthropic work, they sponsored a series of conferences at Mohonk with national import about the formation of government policy toward the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then later he got into the issue of world uh, peace, to, uh, arbitration. And those conferences had all the big names, Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, all that. So when they came, a lot of people on the East Coast followed. And they just came to winter here? Just to winter. Were they here. coming annually? They started in 1889 and never missed a winter until their deaths. Where were they living? Uh, they were living at Mohawk. And, and, where then, and then here, they bought 200 acres of property in southwest Redlands and created a botanical park put their two houses in the park and called it Canyon Crest Park. Today, the area is known as Smiley Heights. And that's where they lived and that's just where they, in the winter? Just in the winter. That's where they lived. I had assumed they built yeah. those when they settled here from them. Yeah. Wow. So they would come uh, November and leave at the end of April or early May. That was their routine. I'm going to take us off track. Sure. Just for a moment. The university was here already or not? Well, the university, that, that's sort of an interesting thing, too, because the, when the university started in 1907, it was, 1906 was the planning, it was a kind of a bidding war. The American Baptists uh, were looking for to, to start a new university. 
Um, the, and and um, so there were a lot of towns interested in it. Pasadena, Azusa, Riverside, some of the beach communities. And the people of Redlands decided they wanted a college. And so a whole group uh, got behind. The, the, Daniel Smiley, the younger brother, would ultimately be on the university board. But Albert was not, he was supportive, but he was not terribly involved in getting to college at that time because a lot of it was happening in the summer. He was away. Mm -hmm. He was on the board at Pomona. He was on the board at Brown University and uh, Vassar. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, uh, their influence, though, in, in encouraging other people of the importance of higher education made quite a difference for this town because the college has had a huge impact in subsequent years. It was a, it was a very important decision. Here's what I'm getting at. The Smiley family, we've got uh, Judson and Brown. Right. We've got the Smileys. Right. We've got the university. Right. And uh, I don't know what the religious denomination was for Judson and Brown or if they were separate from each other, but we've got the Baptists. Right. Settling here with this university, we've got the Quakers settling here. Right, ultimately, I'm right, going right, to right. form our cultural right, center, right, right. and um, I would say that Redlands is kind of on the map for being a Mormon community. And I know we have a strong Catholic contingent, so I'm just kind of looking. You grabbed right. my attention when you talked about there being Quakers at the religious diversity, and wondering if there was any contention of somebody. No, in fact, I think the the, it's a very good question because. Um, uh, we, we think of contention now in terms of the current ideological and cultural wars that the country's in. Um, uh, there were still issues then. I, I, I don't want to try and paint 1907 as a fabulous, perfect time. But to get this college, it was interesting how all of the denominations, uh, Harold Bell Wright, the famous author that wrote The Eyes of the World, an uh, expose of Redlands and fiction, mm -hmm. um, he had just come to town. He was a Disciples of Christ a minister, uh, and he got out in front and said, we need to get this college and, and raise money for it. Uh, the Harris family, Philip Harris, are Jewish merchants and very important in Redlands and San Bernardino history, of course, got right in front and said, we need to have this college, not thinking anything that was being founded by American Baptists. Uh, as I say, the Smileys. There, there was a um, Judson was a Presbyterian, and the Brown was Congregational. Huge ecumenical. They just sort of looked to a bigger picture, mm -hmm. which I think is an interesting lesson about it. The bottom line in Redlands history: the best things and the greatest things have been done when everybody just thinks of community mm -hmm. and not themselves. And this was one of those examples. Okay, I'm putting you back on track. So yeah. the Smileys are settling here in the winter. And, and uh, what they did was to uh, make an arrangement with the city. The park was so stunning and so beautiful with 5,000 different varieties of plants and uh, seven miles of road and surrounded with producing orange grove, but just, it was stunning and the vistas. Canyon Crest, we were to. So people, you know, right, so people wanted to come and see it. And um, the city realized this could be a big tourist thing. And astoundingly, a contract emerged that I think a lot of people don't know about. In that day and age, property taxes were important. They really were the main support for a local community. Mm -hmm. And so the city said, we'll forgive property taxes for the most part if you will open the park up for free. So they agreed. This is part of their community spirit, but it isn't mm -hmm. very good logic if you think about it. To let 75,000, 100,000 people a year tromp through their private botanical park mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in order for that arrangement. So with the orange groves and the produ production that you could get in those days and profit, they could pretty well sustain the whole operation without, without losing. When that contract was canceled in the early 1930s during the Depression, the family had to close the park because it, it, they just couldn't, and the tourism had long uh, winnowed down. Mm -hmm. So the park from the 30s until it was subdivided uh, in the early 60s uh, was just strictly private. How did people get to it? With the cable cars um, on the Oh yeah, there was a, a, a car line that went to the one entrance to the south. Mm -hmm or the north entrance, 
and then there was a south entrance up near Sunset uh, Drive. So um, you, you got it off of Cypress Avenue, was the uh, Terracina, was where it generally went in. Okay. Yeah. So and at what point did they settle here permanently? Um, well, they never settled here permanently, oh. except, um, except Daniel's daughter Ruth, Ruth Smiley, Sanborn Drake. Ruth settled in Redmond. She ended up and her husband only being given the park in the will when Daniel died. But she settled here uh, in 1912, uh, well, actually a little earlier, permanently, and, um, and lived in Redlands uh, from a young woman, but although she was back at Mohawk a lot. And then her descendants continued to own the park until um, uh, portions of it after it was sold in 62. Oh. So, and there are still descendants from her line here in Redlands, but the rest of the family is still all east and based. Although, although Jero Smiley, uh -huh. uh, who will be 91 this next March, um, is, um, got, has come here for the winter for more than 20 years. So he's followed the family pattern of staying here. Tell me about what happened to the park and why it's no longer Well, there. this is a, <laughs> you know, I was a, in high school when all this occurred, so I remember it well. It's not like a childhood memory of nostalgia, I actually remember. What happened was um, uh, a failure of vision and, uh, a, and a good deal of impracticality from Ruth's uh, husband, Arthur Drake. And they wanted out under, he wanted out under the expense of it and uh, felt they could have a better life by selling most of it and keeping about 10 or 15 acres of, of the better part of the ridge. And so um, uh, they, they, they asked the city for 250000 Now, ironically, that's what it cost to create in 1889 and 90. So this is now 1961, 62, when this discussion is going on. And um, I remember um, talking uh, later to the uh, former city manager, Pete Merritt Jr. at that time, and the council talked over and he said, but Larry, basically our, our philosophy was, well, what would we do with it? Well, of course, the, the temptation is to want to be critical and say, well, what a, a dense move that is. But on the other hand, I can understand the city, 1962 or three, the era of tourism has passed by, there's 200 acres and all the upkeep. But then on the other hand, where was the vision factor? Yeah. You know. Uh, people were not making 200-acre botanical parks among the most famous in the world. I remember interviewing Mary uh, Kimberly Shirk uh, uh, for my thing on the Smileys, my master's thesis. And she said, you know, I'll tell you one thing. She said, I thought that we were fairly well known as in the Kimberly Clark business, Kleenex and Snap. They said, I was aboard ship in 1936 on a round-the-world tour. And she said, I'd say well, I was from Redlands, California, and it meant nothing to anybody. And then I'd say something like, well, that's where Smiley Heights is. And she said, everybody at the ship table, oh, Smiley Heights. Oh, really? So she said, it really had made its uh, imprint. Uh -huh. yeah. So there was uh, a lot of, do you want the footnote in all this? So Redlands shoots itself in the foot and doesn't figure out how to buy the park. Uh -huh. So then, a few months later, the next crisis comes when a group of local people decide they want to put a mobile home park in Prospect Park. So that caused a huge uproar because that park is a miniature park of what Smiley Heights was, beautiful little jewel, and the town split, boy it was ugly, uh, a huge fight to save that park. And the park was saved, and a lot of it was a residual feeling that we really blew it on on Smiley Heights. Meanwhile, in New York, we have a dramatic effect for our foot shooting upon the Smiley family because they're sitting with 7,500 acres of land and they were so stunned that Redlands was not interested in continuing the patrimony uh, of what they had. The Eastern family wasn't going to get any money from this, uh, but they were just stunned. Had they, had they willed it to the city? They bequeathed it to the city? Well, no, Ruth owned it. She got Ruth it from her father, it. Daniel. And it was Ruth's husband that was pushing this deal. Um, and they were old, you know, elderly. And um, to make a long story short, the New York family met and determined to spin out 5,000 acres of that 7,500 into a permanent nature preserve 
which today has been added to and is the largest privately managed nature preserve in the entire Northeast. And where is it? In it's in, uh, at Mohonk and the surrounding Oh, okay. Land. Not here. No, no. So, so our uh, lack of vision helped to impel them for a greater vision. Sort of mm -hmm. ironic that it went that way. So what ended up happening? There are houses there now. Um, the, um, uh, again, uh, Arthur Drake didn't think they needed Alfred Smiley's house because no, it had been rented, but nobody was really in it. So they had it raised in the 1940s. And then um, the uh, Albert Smiley house burned uh, in the early 1950s. So the two houses are gone. However, on the Albert Smiley site, uh, Arthur and uh, Ruth Smiley built a, a new one-story modern home uh, that's on that site now. And so the, the original Albert Smiley home site and the surrounding acreage is still there and is now privately owned. Okay, and the rest of the garden were just sold to developers? Right. Okay. In the 60s. Right. Okay, going back to uh, when they were alive and uh -huh. they were here, they had a vision for Redlands of their own, right. which involved culture. Talk to me about their attitude. I'll talk to you about culture. A, a bittersweet footnote on the, on the uh, uh, 125th Quasco Centennial of the city, since we're doing that in this interview as part yes. of it. At the 75th Diamond Jubilee, Ruth Smiley had opened up the park for one last time so people could drive down the whole of the Crest Road oh. and through it. And it was a very moving, bittersweet conclusion during the 75th Jubilee, too. Uh, does that make sense? It just yeah. was kind of a, okay. Uh, they were um, uh, fascinated by learning and culture, um, by uh, science, and by the fact that uh, communities are built better by if people talk to each other. So back to Mohawk. I said that they had two things going for them, and incidentally today the operation has changed. There is a, you can purchase alcohol, they're, they've had dancing, and uh -huh. but still kept the basic principles, still keeps them intact, that's what makes it so distinctive. But they, on this emphasis of people with people and people with nature, uh -huh. well that's one of the things they continued to do out here, and they believed in the importance of people having dialogue and talking. And so, um, just as in the East Coast, if you look here at the library, there are conversation areas. I don't know if people often come in here, maybe you don't see them, but near the fireplaces, there's window seats. When I was and a child, now I'm interrupting sure. for my own gain. When I was a child, sure. I spent most of my childhood in this library. And I just loved those little alcoves with the seating, and there was one in the main section that had children's books in it, mm -hmm. and the little fireplaces and harps. Mm -hmm. And those were just like magical little getaways That's for me. Right. Those were the Part of the library I couldn't wait to go sit in. Well, then you say better than I could, that's the smileys at work. Okay. That's part of the... Then the other was community dialogue, and they were great activists. Uh -huh. So Alfred, for example, when he heard that citizens wanted a library, got in the thick of it and said, I'll help lead, and his force was so strong that he became, after the election of the citizens to create a library, he became the first president of the board. And it was Alfred who said to his brother, Albert, in four years we've outgrown our quarters and uh, we need a, a library and you're going to build it. <laughs> and Albert said, I am. And so Alfred convinced him and this is how we got the downtown park and the library today. And Alfred continued as president of the board until his death in 1903. And then Albert picked up the, the uh, enthusiasm from his brother and so he gets this terrific building designed and gives it. And then um, builds another extension in 1906, the, the long reference wing that, mm -hmm. that goes out. And then on his deathbed, uh, tells Daniel that he has to build a children's wing. And so that was in 1912, and then Daniel uh, uh, saves and gets the money and builds that wing in 1920. So that's the kind of stewardship in terms of the library. And that's what led Andrew Carnegie, when he was here in 1910, to visit Smiley, uh, to say to the press, 
I don't know why you're honoring me. Uh, I've only given that away. I mean, I was one of the richest men in the world yeah. at the time. I've only given away that um, that I've earned. It really, you should be honoring Albert. He went out and borrowed the money he to give his me. gift to the people of Redlands. So I, I always use that as a litmus test for what I call the cheapness test of people in Redlands when they say, oh, I can't give $10 or I can't give 100 to this. And I'll say, well, Albert went out and borrowed the money to give the library and the park. Yeah. Uh, surely <laughs> you can figure something out. Wow. That is great. And, and then family service was Alfred's baby. It was? And he became the founding president of family service. It was the ministerial association. He didn't do it alone. So I want to emphasize that. They never did anything It was alone. called the House of Neighborly Service? No, it was the Redlands Ministerial Association. Okay. And they decided to create a, a new form of charitable enterprise. So it became known as Family Service. House of Neighborly Service was another organization oh. that came later. And uh, so Alfred uh, was the founding president of that. And then uh, they were involved in the pushing the Horticultural and Improvement Society along. They were strong on education and uh, believed in that. So, so it's that kind of kinetic energy. They were people that, and, and then other people in Redlands, that's the other thing. They and others came here and they had, to, I tell people, they had money in their pockets, they had time in their hands, they had goodwill in their hearts. It was a unique period of time when all that energy was stirring up to create the institutions that we have now. Okay, uh, so let's jump to the Burgess era, as I refer to it. Larry Burgess becomes associated with the library. How did that happen? It was a mistake. <laughs> I came in to check a book out of the library. Uh -huh. I was at the end of writing my dissertation. I was looking for jobs to teach history, American history, in uh, community college or college, somewhere in America. It's 1972. The job market is crummy. The economy isn't very good. Mm -hmm. The nation's still in the wrangle about a lot of social issues and the wind down of the Vietnam War. It was not a pretty place to be in terms of the job market in general. Mm -hmm. And so I came into the library, and the library director, Phyllis O'Shea, whom I had known because of that work I'd done on the Smileys, and I used this library a lot in, in college. Do you still have the master's thesis you did on the Smileys? Yeah, it became a book. It's, it became the, the little book. It's now long out of print. But, wow. But anyway... So you came in and Phyllis was there. And she said, how are you doing? So, of course, being the kind of person I was, I told her all of my woes and troubles and <laughs> frustrations, and I'm sure she thought, why did I ask? And um, she said, well, did you do any Civil War? And I said, well, yes, I had Alan Nevins, this wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning historian, who had written this eight volume history of the ordeal of the Union, it was called. And she said, well, are you looking for part time work? I said, well, what have you got in mind? She said, well, the curator at the Lincoln Shrine is leaving. Would you be willing to take it for six months till we get somebody permanent? And I thought, whoa, I'm at home, I don't own a car, I'm finishing my dissertation, nobody wants to hire me, would I take it? I can start in an hour. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and so uh, that was my first job. Where did you live at the time? And I was living at home with my parents on Cypress Avenue, and I think they were very thrilled to thought I wouldn't continue to be under tow. And um, uh, so it was a part-time, and I got in there, and I started opening up the drawers and looking, and there were treasures in there, unbelievable things. And I'd known it as a kid, because you always went over and they always showed you that bullet from the, that you could look through and see a picture at the end. From the, They put this little microscopic picture, long story. And uh, I thought, wow, this is really pretty incredible. And I didn't realize it, but the library board at the same time, and uh, someone connected to your history, Bill Moore, who was president sure. of the board, who with his brother owned the facts, it's a publisher, Bill and Phyllis wanted to start a local and regional history collection. So after about a month at the Lincoln Shrine, they came to me and said, we're thinking of putting the Lincoln operation and this new history division under one 
unit, creating it and calling it Archives and Special Collections. Would you be interested in doing this and would you be willing to stay a year at least to get this going? How old were you at the time? So I was 26 okay. and um, I said, sure, what's a year? Put aside the college hiring plans. So that's why I said it was a mistake. It was. Uh, probably a fluke, but it really was, in that I was not coming in for a job, and I certainly wasn't going to stay here more than a year. Mm -hmm. Well, Where did you want to go? 40 years later. Well, I want any place. I saw myself in the classroom, only in the classroom, you know. Outside of Redlands? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would have taken a job and I mean, not me in some area. Somebody will watch this and be mad, but in some other <laughs> less desirable place, I would have taken it. Um, and so I got into it because of my senior paper at the University of Redlands, which was on the history of the community. I naturally had some familiarity with that. So here I am, knowing about the Civil War, and Lincoln, of course, and then the local history. So it was I thought, whoa, what has happened here? So one year became two, and then two became five, and five became 20, and then 20 became 40. Okay, but you didn't leave as the curator for the shrine. No, in I didn't. Special collection. That was a big. Uh, uh, that was a di difficult time, because uh, they wanted me to become the director, uh, but they were going to hold a national competition. Okay, but at some point you retired, and you were not the curator of the shrine and, and the right. special collections, you were the director of the library. How did that come to pass? Well, what happened uh, in, in 1985, um, there were some issues of contention that had developed about the uh, uh, running of the library. The uh, state law, the education code, uh, prescribes for five appointed trustees to, and, and the exact words of the sentence are, shall administer. Well, that's an imperative in the law, shall. And administer is administer. And um, there was some feeling over at City Hall that they wanted to run everything, which is often typical okay. of, of City Hall. Let me clarify. The city owns this library. That's correct. M not every library in every city is a city-owned library. We are... Well, They're some, not city, always like some that, cities, the have, yeah, some uh, jurisdictions have county libraries. Some have district, library districts. We're a general law city, and under that, the state education code uh, lays out how libraries may be created in, in, in towns like Redlands. Okay. So that code authorizes for five trustees uh, to, to uh, uh, manage the library, and um, they're appointed by the mayor, so that's your, your uh, legal protection that the mayor and the council vote for the trustees and they may serve at the will and pleasure but they're appointed and then they have the power of like I work for them so a lot of people don't know the library director reported to the board my contract so I was an at will employee from year to from year to year so they decided what needed to be done and and you executed it right okay right and um, to make a long story short, back in 85, there were these issues that were being stirred up, and it was a difficult time, and my predecessor uh, had, had uh, moved on, and there was a, so I was interim library director very quickly, and <clears throat> I thought I could take it on and did, but I had no interest really in pursuing it, because my love was obviously in the archives. Well then, uh, it, things went well, and some of the trustees suggested that I might want to throw my hat in the ring, no guarantee. There was a national search, and there were seven finalists, and five were out of state. And um, anyway, I ended up being selected. Had you, when you were running the other uh, sections, thought to yourself, gosh, if I were running this library, I'd do this, or I've got these ideas, but I don't want to see You know, it's an interesting point. Yeah, occasionally you do think that. Uh, but uh, in a way you're sort of naive because you, you're not realizing the actualization that you won't be what you were doing. Mm -hmm. you know, you're know, you just thinking, here's what I would change. So when I made that decision to apply, I knew that it was going to change my life. But I also knew that they wanted an emphasis on outreach, fundraising, and restructuring the library. And that was, I could tell, was a heavy 
uh, point that the board was pushing at. What do you mean restructuring? Well, uh, they, they, they sensed that times were changing in the 80s. Uh, technology wasn't what we know it now, but it was there. And how are we going to embrace that? Um, they wanted uh, a, a bit more outreach on programmatic issues, and particularly programs that would attract adults as well as children. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and to keep the uh, expanded base, passing it from one generation to another. So, um, and they wanted more uh, visible presence. They wanted me to do a lot of public programming and, and so forth. So, um, uh, that's what we uh, embarked upon. And uh, that's how it, how it all turned out. Okay, uh, so you did a lot. Well, you, for the people who are watching this in the future, you just retired last month. Right after 40 years, right. and during that 40 years, we've seen, off, gosh, off the top of my head, the windows have come in, the rebuilding, the painting it back to the original color, and the tower that we're sitting in now. Uh, we expanded it in 18, 18, 19, 18, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, the remodel, I'll call it. Uh, that came about an interesting set of circumstances. Uh, it was the centennial of the city of Redlands, and I happened to have been chairing the centennial committee. And then out of the, really almost out of the blue, some people on the council, uh, and uh, the, the then mayor, Carol Beswick, uh, along with the library trustees, decided that maybe this would be a good fulcrum to expand the library. It became the project for the centennial. Now, a lot of people think, boy, wasn't I brilliant to engineer as chair of the Centennial Committee, the city committing to expand the library. I was a peripheral player on this until it started getting going. I had no idea it was even being uh, uh, plotted, and I'm, I'm sort of happy to get that on record because I was worrying about other things like the events. Well, then when I realized that everybody was serious about this and that the council was really going to designate I remember one councilman came up to me and he said, now is the time to do this. You'll never get another chance. And boy, was that the truth. Because from 89 and 90, following that, California went into a recession in 91 and 2. City government went into some uh, changes during that period within its general management system. The councils changed completely. The priorities by 2000 had merged into something completely uh, uh, different. And then the economic bottom fell out in 2007 and 8, and here we are. When would that expansion have even uh, struck a chance? So the timing was perfect, and it was the first time that the citizens of Redlands were called upon to expand their library. Before that time, it had all been gifts from different families. So I, I think it was time, and it's been a fantastic uh, well, let's, let's talk about what was done. I'm going to start with the color. When I was a child, this hmm. library was painted white. Right. But yeah. it was originally bricks, right. and now it's painted like bricks, right? right? It's it was always brick slurry, which is what we have now. Uh, it's a thin coat of a material that's actually made from crushed brick-like substance. And it's put on like with a, with a paintbrush, literally. And uh, the slurry was there in 1898, and it was the earthquake of uh, Long Beach in 1933 that caused a new building code for public buildings, and uh, the tower was removed as a result of that, and uh, at the same time there was a movement, uh, Elmer Gray, the architect of the Lincoln Shrine, think Beverly Hills Hotel, mm -hmm. uh, of which he was the architect, Elmer Gray decided that the Lincoln Shrine octagon would be better served by a neutral colored library, that the red was too dominant, and that the Lincoln Shrine was being sort of lost out back. Mm -hmm. And he convinced the library trustees. And so they, they creamed the library. The only way we got it back again was a mistake. There were 11 to 14 coats of lead-based paint, and the paint on the exterior finally was just breaking down, uh, and water was seeping into the walls. We had termite issues. The roof 
had badly deteriorated because of deferred maintenance over the years that the city coffers didn't permit for the whole. So uh, the council realized that this was a, a mess and authorized in 2003 and 4 to get the work done. But here's the interesting thing. The lead had to be removed. And so as the layers of paint were completely removed, there we were down with stains, of course, to what the building looked like. And everybody went, oh. Striking. And so it was cheaper and in the long range more efficient to put the slurry back. So the original plan was to repaint it white? Yeah. Okay. And so I was thrilled because I had come close to compromising my job in the 1980s when we did some restoration work and I urged at the time to put it back to the slurry. Oh, well, you thought I would have said dirty words on the street corner in front of some important place. Because, and the president of the board came up and said, you better lay back on this, because this is too sensitive an issue. It really got ugly. And the paper, the facts covered it pretty consistently. Uh, in fact, at a dinner, I was emceeing a dinner for the hospital, and the featured speaker was Tom Brokaw. And Tom Brokaw, I sat next to him, and he was asking what I was doing, and I was telling him about this scrap, and he said, gee, I've been in the news business a long time. He said, you know, you better choose and pick your battles carefully. Are you sure that the color of the libraries won't do? So I thought, oh man, I've even gotten, uh, you know, somebody from a national feeling telling me to back off. So what I couldn't do, Lead did. Wow. And, um, and I think the building, it brought back the architectural feel. Mm -hmm. when, when we put the tower back, it okay, brought back so the, the vertical. The tower came in 98, 99. And I remember watching it being built on sure. the lawn. Sure, sure, sure. And then they lifted it up and dropped right. it on the library. Yeah. Where we're sitting. So right. this is new construction, what we're sitting here. Uh, above us, right above, above us. us. Okay. And, you know, and I'm thrilled to say the tower, all of it, private contributions. Um, no, no expense, and then the, the exterior renovation, uh, we paid for half of it, the city, the library raised private funds, and then the city paid the other half, and um, it, it's given a, the, the life back to the, to the building. And the importance of that is not so much just for the aesthetic, because I can think a lot of people are saying, well, gee, that's a lot to commit just for, no, it's made it, again, the singularly architectural, beautiful, it was always a lovely building. Mm -hmm. But everything had been painted out. Now all the detail, the sandstone, the design work, all of the art, it's all there in the exterior of the building. And when people drive up, it's a wow moment. Yeah, you know, the stone around the arches, wow. they pop yeah. against the yeah. red. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the rooms are different now. There's the there's the addition of the uh, the little garden and the extra section. I keep going like this. Yeah, sure. In that direction, but, uh, we added the Scott Conservatory, Conservatory which is the reading room for the periodicals. We renovated the children's room. We, um, put, we built the heritage wing for the archives. Uh, we built the downstairs new south stacks in which the Friends of the Library bookstore is located. And it's where the new coffee shop I is. So it's been, uh, uh, and the gardens reflect, um, uh, if, if you have a careful eye when you look out the Scott Conservatory through the Redlands Federal Garden of the Lincoln Shrine, it's all Lincoln roses that leads you to that, and the octagon face of the uh, reading room matches the octagon front of the Lincoln Shrine, and the windows are even curved to recognize that same feeling. So the architect had a really nice aesthetic. Let's talk windows for a minute. Yeah. Okay, the windows in this building are magnificent. Tell me about the, the well, Tom's first. Well, we, we got... Um, uh, well, let's see, where should I start on? Let me, uh, let me just say very quickly, the first stained glass windows uh, were put in by the Smileys themselves. And they all are window panels under, uh, under these giant rose windows, but anyway, uh, that uh, reflect the, the patterns of learning. Uh, science, art, literature, music. Mm -hmm. And so later, as the library went on, we thought, you know, Maybe a memorial here or two of stained glass would continue that theme that would mean something to Redlands. And as a result, the children's room has some terrific memorial windows in it, dealing with children's literature, uh, 
along the school and there's one on the garden. It was really terrific. Um, the heritage room has some deal directly with history of, of different of different people. And then uh, when I retired, I was floored. I'd always wanted to get the window that you look down in the administrative hall uh, to do it. And uh, the, that was the trustee gift to me, is I get this wonderful stained glass window to memorialize the aspects of the library. So some of the windows, and there's a finite opportunity to do this. Yeah, there's about three left. They're, um, they're dedicated. They were purchased in right. memory or in honor right. of somebody. I was right. here when Dorothy... Uh, oh, Ray yeah. Uh, or, or, um, Dorothy Arthur. Arthur's, yeah. yeah. Uh, was put in, and it's yeah. her, I guess her favorite story was Cinderella, and right. it's the Kimberly Crest yeah. with Cinderella. He did running a great down. job with that. It, it takes my breath away. Yeah. Um, so you, there's going to be one in tribute to you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's on it? Uh, I've seen the design. It reflects a lot of different aspects of the library, and I think it even shows me in the tower at one oh, point. Oh, that's yeah, I mean, a tiny, you won't know it's me, but the figure. Uh -huh. And then there's um, Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh and Charlotte's Web are, are in there as well. Right. Okay. So there's three left. Yeah. How much does it cost to get them? Well, the, the, they run, it uh, depends. Uh, some of them have been as, uh, now it's over the decades, so, uh -huh. you know, when, but it, it right now it runs between seven and nine thousand dollars. Okay, and we should give credit to Tom. Uh, he's, he's done a wonderful job of keeping theme and context. Yeah. And he makes them. He designs them and creates them here right. in Redlands. Right. Um, okay. When you did some of this remodel, I'm going off the deep end now. Okay. Uh, did you run into any ghosts? What's the situation here? Well, we get asked this all the time, and every year at Halloween, I remember when I was in the archives, uh, there was always the call, often from the newspapers, tell us about the ghosts of Redlands. And mm -hmm. I always tell people it's sort of a disappointing story, because it really isn't a whole lot. But, uh, some of the staff actually think that they've seen or felt a presence in some of the basement areas. I think people maybe forget that there's as much square footage below the library as there is on top. It's fully basemented, mm -hmm. so that's why we're able to store uh, what we do. And uh, I myself have not uh, felt that, mm -hmm. but we do have staff people that say that they've seen... Do, uh, do like they a, think it's the Smiley Brothers? No, uh, uh, their general consensus is that they think it's maybe... Uh, former high school page that worked here and who unfortunately was uh, killed uh, in an accident. I don't know. Not here. Whether, not here. Was buried no, in not here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Speaking of underground, there's yeah. a rumor, I'm sure you've heard, that the is it the library is connected to Safety Hall through underground tunnels? There's yeah, a there's, yeah, yeah. no, no, I wish that were true. It makes sort of be a lot more interesting to transport stuff around. No, we're completely landlocked. And what there is, uh, is that there's some cable chases that go under the park, but I mean, you'd have to be the size of a rat to get through them. Okay. Yeah. The uh, building was redone, did it have seismic? Uh, yes, it's had, it's had uh, three goes at seismic retrofitting, mm -hmm. beginning in the 80s continuing through the 90s, and then with the tower would be the last one. Okay, so we're yeah. stable here. I noticed looking yeah. out the windows, there's, there's yeah, big metal the, braces. Yeah, the metal bro braces, yeah. That's what those are yeah. for? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see, let's talk about your association with the university for a minute. The, you are a professor. Well, I teach, uh, I'm an, on the adjunct faculty, and I teach a course once a year on the history of Southern California, the city of Redlands, and the university and how do the three have a synergy and relate to each other. And I've done that for you know, 30 years. But um, I've also uh, been on the board of trustees for a number of years, and have enjoyed working with that end of it as well. I gotta tell you, as a student, I never thought I'd end up on the board, trust me. But, um, and I think some of my friends are still scratching their head, because I was a good student, but I wasn't totally innocent as an undergraduate. Uh, anyway, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And your wife is... And my the, wife is the Vice President, Dean of Students. And we interviewed a couple right. of weeks ago, and you met there. Actually, we met because of it. We, didn't, we knew each other, but she's two years younger than I, and 
she ran in kind of a different crowd than I did, so we never really ever talked. But once we had graduated, she then went to work at Redlands, and I was uh, on a committee with her, for, called the Young Alumni Committee, and we mm -hmm. met at a house in Pasadena. Oh, you're kidding. And that's where we first said, oh, I know you, I remember your name, and, I, and that's how it started. I have a University of Redlands yearbook that has both of you in it. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah well, Betty Tyler comes into my office, with, I say I have. Blow the dust yes. off of it occasionally, she, oh, look at this. <laughs> came and said, do you recognize they these were, two people? I said, no. They were young <laughs> once. <laughs> All right, and you serve on lots of other boards. The, I could name probably four off the top of my head, but I don't want to embarrass myself. I, I well, know. I was going to say, it, it's been a good run. I was able to help be one of the charter members of the Historical Society and the Redlands Conservancy. And, I've, you know, I've been involved in the, helping with the beginnings of the Redlands Community Foundation, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a great uh, opportunity to weave and, you know, serve through a lot of these organizations. And you knew the Moores. I did very well. Frank ran all of my master's thesis uh, in the Redlands Grain of Salt Facts, uh, Redlands mm -hmm. Grain of Salt the Facts, over a period, I think it was almost uh, six weeks. I was so grateful to him. He, he liked the story. It's before we put it into book form. But he just thought the people of Redlands should know what that family meant. And so that was a lot of ink. How did you and, come to uh, have that relationship with him, that he would see your master's thesis? Well, um, uh, Frank, uh, uh, he had kids uh, that were a little a year older, one of them. And so I sort of knew them in town, you know, and my dad was a businessman here in town, so he knew, and my parents knew both Frank and Bill. But um, he got word that I was doing this. You know, Redlands was small, this as it is now. It's bigger, but still small. And anyway, he asked me about it. He called me in one day, as only Frank could, you know. So I went into the office, and there he was. He's grilling me about it. He wanted to know what I was, where I'd been, what I was doing. and so. He, uh, when it was done, he said, let me know when it's done. He said, I want to see it. So I gave it to him, and then he called me up. He said, I think I want to run this as grains of salt. Wow. So that was very, um, it was a big boost, because it said to me, somebody's interested in this stuff. Mm -hmm. You always wonder, what am I doing in life? You know, is anybody really interested? Uh, and, and, and he was. And then Bill, when he was president of the board, took a great interest, since I was starting out for them this program in special collections and archives, he was very supportive of that. And uh, I have to say the paper played a major role in helping to advance uh, the library whenever it could. They were very, very good, good about that. I mean, they advanced a lot of rhythms, but I mean, they really, because of their personal interests, were, I, I owe them a lot. I could take full credit for that. Go ahead. I think I will. Go ahead. <laughs> what am I forgetting to ask? Well, I think probably we bored the viewers, but I, that you covered the, I think, the groundwork pretty well. All right. This is the Glasgow Centennial um, interview. Right. Uh, do you have any thoughts on Redlands as it hits 125 years? Do you want to wax poetic? <laughs> Well, there's a curve. I, yeah, I think that uh, if I were to think about it, the 125th, is maybe it's a good time to remind people that some of Redland's greatest achievements, I mean greatest, and some of its most important institutions were created by Redlanders at a time that you would least suspect possible, in depression, mm -hmm. in recession, during war. So I think for me, the Quasco Centennial is an opportunity to re-remind people that it's easier to say no, but it's more important to say yes, and the history bears that out. And so I think that really should be a capstone to build uh, enthusiasm and commitment, and to realize that in many ways, I think the best days of the community are still ahead. I mean, the, the predecessors that I've talked about today were, were in many ways visionary. But they didn't think vision stopped with them. So even though I'm an historian, I'm always saying, let's just don't look to the pioneers as the stopping ground or the fixed 
a point of the compass to navigate. They're just showing you a light so that you can navigate in other directions. And I think that's really the answer. That's wonderful. I didn't expect such a goodness out of that question. <laughs> Thank you for sitting with me today. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you for doing this series. It's very important to history to get a lot of these people down. <laughs>